Sky. I'm Matt Sky. Welcome to Sky vs. Sky. I'd like to welcome my guest, Adam Kokish, host of the radio show, web show, uh, Adam vs. The Man. Now, why are you going up against The Man? <laughs> well, thanks for having me on. The Thank Man is anybody who wants to tell you how to live your life and thinks that they can use the force of government to enforce their will on basically what amounts to the minority of people that want to do things that are contrary to the mainstream. And we have this enshrined idea in um, America that democracy is a good idea when our founders were directly against the, uh, the idea at least of a pure democracy, but really any form of democracy, even with elected representatives, fundamentally at some level represents the majority imposing its will by the force of government on the minority. So. That's why the man is an offensive character that we are opposing. Okay. And uh, now you consider yourself generally a libertarian Republican, if I'm not mistaken. And Absolutely. It but it's libertarian first. I'm a libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist who just so happens to be a Republican, principle before party. Principle before party. That's always a, a good foundation. And what is it about the libertarian principle or principles that uh, you stand by that you feel... Uh, distinguish it from other, say, run-of-the-mill Republicans? Well, it's really from all different political ideologies, not just from other Republicans. The ideals of libertarianism are based on the philosophical principles of self-ownership. You own your body, no one else can claim ownership of that. And the non-aggression principle, that is that it's immoral to use force against someone who's acting peacefully, exercising their own property rights, and not interfering with anybody else's rights. And government, by definition, represents a violation of that at some level. Government is a monopoly on the initiation of force that is socially granted to you know various extents over a certain arbitrary geographical area. It is an immoral concept founded on this idea that while it's totally immoral for you to hit someone or for you to steal or for you to take a gun and go on the other side of the world and just start killing people, mm -hmm. if we do it in the name of government, it's okay. And when you learned don't hit and don't steal in kindergarten, it wasn't unless you're a police officer or an IRS agent. And when you learn thou shalt not kill, it wasn't unless your dear leader gives you a gun and a <laughs> uniform, a fancy costume. Right, unless it's convenient, yeah, right, right. And a one-way ticket to the other side of the world. So it's that fundamental moral concept extended into government. Now you have, uh, you, you were a Marine, you were in uh, Iraq, right? And, and you uh, faced combat. So it, this is interesting, you take a very anti-war stance. Uh, what, Absolutely. what brought you to that conclusion? Was it what you saw in Iraq? I mean, when you were there, were you already kind of feeling like, I don't belong here? At what point did that, that shift take place? Well, I could explain it best by saying that I, I've always been a libertarian. I've always thought the world just kind of worked better when people were free to decide what they put in their own bodies. They're able to interact with, in, in the market without people limiting their freedom to do what's best for them economically. And when we're not killing each other in large numbers. So as a humanitarian, I've always been anti-war, but that's the problem with, with not understanding the real core of philosophical libertarianism, that you can't attack someone unless you've been attacked. And so I was actually against the war in Iraq before the war, before I went. I went to the one day of student walkouts in February of 2003, but then I was pro-occupation, you could say. I volunteered to go with the civil affairs team and was in Fallujah for seven months in 2004 during the uh, intense fighting in, in April in the well, first battle. some of the most intense fighting out there, if I'm not mistaken, right? Well, I, I missed the big party, which was November of 2004, oh, okay. but I, I did get my share of combat. Yeah. And coming home from that made me go through a, a unique examination of my principles. I was definitely against the war. I wanted to speak out. I got involved with the Rock Veterans Against the War and the anti-war movement, and it was surrounded by, by lefties, by people that wanted various forms of violent government here in the United States to impose their different ideas of how society should be organized on other people. And it forced me to go through a real transformation, and I can only describe it as going from an intellectual or issues-oriented libertarian, kind of like Gary Johnson, to being a true philosophical and, dare I say, even spiritual libertarian, understanding the moral imperative of spreading this message. And, and I just want to, before we move on, I just want to ask one more thing. So you were in combat and opposing the war at the same time. Am, am I correct on that? 
No, not exactly. I, like I said, I was pro occupation, and that's, this is the danger of just being. So you wanted to be there, but you didn't want to necessarily be taking on the same level of activity that the military was taking on. I was definitely skeptical. Okay. I was definitely skeptical while I was there, but I I fell for the propaganda. You know, I believed that what we were doing was cleaning up our mess and and responsible foreign policy. So. I was really excited to be going in civil affairs and to be helping people. Mm -hmm. And so you got back and you got involved in some activism. Uh, you've been arrested, right? You've had some uh, different uh, situations along those lines. Uh, just give us a quick uh, background on that. <laughs> well, I think I've been arrested a couple dozen times now in, in okay, activism. Enough. And I got involved with the Rock Veterans Against the War when I got out of the military in 2006. Uh, moved to D.C. in 2007. And I have to say, it was a really important experience for me the way I left the military because I got in trouble for bringing a pistol back the first time, mm. just a souvenir that I'd purchased. And I had thought that, uh, you know, as a sergeant who spoke Arabic with civil affairs experience, they'd be able to, you know, brush it over and I'd get to go on my second tour that I was trying to go on. And I was activated again in 2006. But spent most of that time managing a barracks and mowing lawns while they went through this ridiculous process with me. And I got busted down the, uh, the day before I got out. Then the day before, I got a medal for my time in Iraq. So I was just disgruntled enough, and for, some, for relatively petty reasons, to really start questioning things. And this is an important thing to point out about the libertarian movement as a whole. You know, we're not necessarily the captains of the football team or the heads of the cheerleader squad you know, we're, we're the misfits uh, often and the punks and those who have been treated badly by the system mm. who are going to be the first to question it. So I got involved with the Rock Veterans Against the War. We did a various uh, civil disobedience actions, but then I ran for Congress in 2010. Right, I was right, endorsed right. by Ron Paul, and that's what got me into my media career because I was one of those candidates that just couldn't shut up when the race was over. Now, how do you feel about Ron Paul? He's obviously a very unique candidate, to say the least. <laughs> Ron Paul is a hero. He has freed so many millions of hearts and minds to this message and woken so many up to the reality of the nature of government. The, the gratitude that those of us who have, have benefited from him feel is, is absolutely immeasurable. He's been doing this for decades and been true to what he believed in for so long that he has stuck to his guns and stayed in the fight for so long is absolutely incredible. There's been some turmoil and some drama recently in the movement around what's going on with his campaign. But I know that he is committed to his principles, and this is why we're organizing the uh, Salute for Ron Paul march on the RNC as Veterans for Ron Paul, like we did for the march on the White House. But this time, we're inviting the entire movement to be behind us, and we're going to show the world the army that is marching with Ron Paul. I think army is probably the right use of words. He seems to have probably the most devoted followers yes. of any politician I've ever seen in my life. Uh, because not, not that I'm that old, but you know, I mean, <laughs> he's not—he's short... not running a campaign. He's running a revolution, and and by revolution, as he says, it's a philosophical revolution, and that's the only kind that really counts. And this is a revolution in thinking that the, that the world is going through as we're, we're evolving past this paradigm of statism. I mean, anytime you say you need government for something, you're basically saying. Well, there's no way we can figure out a way to convince people to go along with this and get this done peacefully through cooperation, so we're just going to have to force our will on people. And the, especially the younger generation, those of us who have the internet hardwired, mm -hmm. who are so inspired by Ron Paul's message and have no tolerance for the kinds of problems that exist for lack of information, see a whole new world that is possible with less government and eventually no government as we're able to, through peaceful, cooperative, free market solutions, render government obsolete. But isn't there a That's problem a when, you, when you, when you, I guess what I always worry about is if you render government too obsolete, doesn't that open the door for corporate capitalism to come in and basically manipulate and uh, basically take control of people's lives rather than an entity which at least is somewhat controlled by the people through elections and through a democracy? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that got me. I, know, I just went head to head with the uh, whole mantra right there. Corporations are controlled by our government. I think you've got it backwards here, man. What? Corporations are government creations. They are entities given special economic powers by government. And the only reason they exist in the way that they do is to insulate them from the will of the people, to protect them 
from the true free market. All right, I mean, I'll just give like an example. Like, let's say there's like the FAA or the FDA. Say we got rid of these organizations in their entirety. What would motivate, say I'm a cereal manufacturer, what would motivate me to make cereal that's safe to the population? I mean, would you just buy the brand that has the... Uh, the least amount of deaths per year or the least amounts of chunks of metal in it. I mean, at some level, doesn't there have to be uh, an independent? And I agree with you. When, when you have corporations mixing in with government, it becomes very dangerous. But wouldn't independent government be a vital uh, part of a, a civil society? Well, it's, it's funny that you use the FDA as an example because the FDA, since its inception and all of its manipulations just of the drug market, has been responsible for literally tens of millions of deaths. The statistics have been added up. The FDA is not a good thing for the American people. You look at but isn't that a bit of a blanket statement? Couldn't you say okay. that the FDA well, has you, no, problems? No, no, that's from from statistics and the way that they've manipulated the drug market, keeping healthy drugs off the market, putting unhealthy drugs on the market. They've been responsible, literally, for tens of millions of deaths in, in in the decades that they've been around in existence. But still, what you're fundamentally saying is we can't figure out a way to make sure that our food supply is safe unless we put guns at people's heads and make them pay for an agency that's not accountable to them in the first place and obviously is proven to be incapable of doing what it's supposed to be doing. If anything, the idea of having it sponsored by government removes the responsibility to respond to the consumers, to respond to the demands of the people that you're supposed to be serving. Do you really think that the only reason cereal manufacturers don't put razors in their cereal is because of the FDA. I would think there's some other reasons and that the public outcry around such an incident would be a lot more of a deterrent than anything that the government could come up with in terms of regulations anyway. I mean, but historically we've seen corporations do horrific things. I mean, look at the tobacco industry and the really uh, overt efforts to conceal uh, their own dangers of their products. And some would argue the cell phone industry currently is concealing uh, some of the dangers of uh, potentially, you know, radiation with regards to putting it up to your uh, head and whatnot. So, I mean, isn't there a place where government can serve as an effective uh, mediator of capitalism, help to make sure the consumer is protected and to make sure that companies can still thrive? Well, using underwriter laboratories is the classic example here, and you can look at the contrast between how many people have died from unsafe electronics in their home versus how many Americans have died from obesity and over, overdose from prescription drugs and complications with medical procedures and all the various things that the FDA has approved and of course the subsidization of corn syrup and the institutionalization right. of the Oh, and corn that's sickening. Syrup. I mean the amount of corn syrup we have and everything is just mind-boggling. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's what happens when you give men with guns the power to decide how the economy should be organized to best keep you safe when really people coming together peacefully, voluntarily, without the violence of government, without the force represented there, are much more capable of providing the needs of the market. If, you, if the market demands that we should have safe foods, safe foods will be provided for in the absence of violence. You don't need to say, no, we're going to put guns to people's heads and we're going to take a portion of your income to pay for it, this institution that is designed to keep you safe that really doesn't have your best interest in heart at heart at the first place because if it was in your best interest we wouldn't have to put a gun to your head to make you pay for it and as is the case with underwriter laboratories it's supported by the market and we have a very safe home electronics industry and really relatively speaking if you look at the actual effects on the average americans health today and obesity and heart disease and uh, you know you point out with uh, cigarettes it's obviously not been very effective but yeah I mean I certainly have no disagreement with uh, with that I, I just I, it seems to me FDA reform would be the solution not elimination uh, it would seem that we would almost need to increase the size of the organization to make sure that we do hold corporations companies and uh, you know whoever's selling a product accountable but you're advocating for more violence and you're advocating not, not for violence i mean i don't think most of the cases have a guy bursting in with a gun at the door make it safe <laughs> well no i mean look at the, look at what the fda is doing now it is literally an act of violence in the way that they enforce their codes and i'm not just talking about the violence of taxation the the, the that is what is behind pain for all this but look at how they're shutting down small independent organic farmers. Look at how they're forcing farmers to shoot their pigs if they don't meet federal regulations for I their totally farm. I totally agree. Those are Look at awful. how they're, they're raiding places for selling 
or raw food and, and raw well, Why milk. does that exist? That exists because of the ties between the corporate interests and the FDA. So the idea to me would right. be to split them as much as you can, not to eliminate so that all you have left is the corporate interest. To me, that would almost prove the level of corruption in our corporations in the first place. Well, the connection between corporations and the government regulatory agencies that support their interests is the government, is the violence of government that goes to enforce all those regulations. The answer isn't more violence because those things are fundamentally inseparable and what you create with the government where you elect people and you have a natural disconnect because politicians can be bribed, a natural disconnect from the will of the people that elected them, you're inevitably going to have that violence that you have instituted in government co-opted by people that are willing to bribe politicians. So inevitably introducing a system based on violating your rights as is government is going to have these consequences of serving the powerful and making it harder to decentralize power. If anything, the government continues to institutionalize power in the hands of the few. That's been the inevitable result. Every single thing that government does is either, either a cover for or as an ex post facto justification or simply a, a farming out, a renting out of the guns of government to stifle competition in order to concentrate ha power in the, in, the, in the hands of the few. That's the main purpose of, of government. I mean, you look at Jamie Dimon going down to Capitol Hill to testify just, just, uh, just yesterday saying that, uh, you know, have, having Senator Schumer, you know, give him a pat on the back for how he's running a, his business, he's going down there not to be grilled on the hot seat and held accountable by government. I mean, all of these senators, their biggest sponsors are people on Wall Street. They're being hired by corporations to create policies to serve them. And, and as soon as you put this violent monopoly in the hands of government and the people think that it's moral to force their will on anybody, it's that what you see today in, in terms of corporatism is an inevitable consequence. Of course, none of this is touching on the issues of the central bank and the imposition of a fiat currency. Well, yeah. Yeah. I know that's a huge, huge thing as well with uh, all libertarianism and Ron Paul as well. Um, but in terms of corporations being less regulated, being less tied into government, do you believe they would suddenly change? They would be less, I guess, um, I, I mean, I'm not saying corporations are evil. I'm not, I don't think, you know, there, there is a, an effort to hurt people, but I think there's just such a vested interest in profit that there is not that level of um, consumer concern. And you see it well, in no, I'm, I'm every actually industry. suggesting what would, uh, in effect, be a much higher standard of regulation, what you would have in a free market. Like I said, if anything, the government serves to insulate businesses from competition. Uh, so They're you're saying like a third party would basically, like a third party company of some kind would be able to, but couldn't they hypothetically be susceptible to the same things the government is though? I'm talking about the ultimate accountability that if a, if, if a corporation today mm -hmm. that's profit driven knows, hey, if we do something really crappy to our customers, well, they can't start another business to compete with ours because the government regulations are in the way. So we're going to get away with treating them pretty crappy. But in a free market, you have an instantaneous response to the market in order to stay profitable. It is only in a government regulated environment that corporations can get away with treating people crappy in the first place and not lose their business. All right. All right. Fair points. Fair points. <laughs> um, so I want to ask you this, uh, just moving it a little bit more forward. Uh, now, Ron Paul, he's obviously developed this huge following right now, a uh, very, very uh, enthusiastic one, and Mitt Romney has the nomination. How are people going to vote? Is this going to be a group that would be willing to even consider Romney, or no way in hell? <laughs> <laughs> no. No true Ron Paul supporter will vote for Romney, even if he nominates Rand as the VP, because we know... Because Rand is a little different than Ron, right? I mean, Rand kind of... Exactly. That's an interesting and, little thing there. And he was kind of stringing people along, to be perfectly honest, that he was just like his father. And he's not. He's and, not know, at he's, all like his father. He's totally... To be fair, he's been, rel he's been, he's been open about it. You know, yeah. it was just that when he was running for Senate and looking for the support of so many who also supported his father, he just didn't say anything and kind of talk the vague philosophical political talk. Do you think people and felt a little bit like they accidentally voted for the wrong guy when it comes to Rand Paul? <laughs> <laughs> I um, thought he was a Ron Paul. What the? <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think anybody was thinking that by the time the election came around. He had made it pretty clear where he stood on the issues. Mm -hmm. And it was clear that he was, uh, you know, a, a true principled small government conservative, but not a libertarian. And that's why people won't support him. Because if you understand that government is evil, because it represents an immoral initiation of force against people who are 
acting peacefully, then Rand is just another lesser evil. I mean, you could say a much, much, much lesser evil, but once you've opened the door for that, what's to stop you from endorsing Mitt Romney? Oh, wait, he just did. <laughs> and I don't think the Ron Paul supporters, you know, some of them will go, um, some of them might vote for Romney, a very small, I can't imagine it being more than 5 10% of people that really were like Rand and supported Ron not because of his philosophy, but because he was principled and he mm -hmm. was honest mm -hmm. and he was committed and consistent in his voting record on the Constitution. But for those of us who supported him because of his philosophy, because of his principles, because of why he was there, no, there's no appeal in supporting Romney. There's very little appeal in supporting Rand. I mean, there's some pragmatic appeal. He's doing good things in the Senate. He's definitely an ally of liberty, but he's not a libertarian. So for me and for those of us who've been paying attention, we really weren't surprised that he endorsed Mitt Romney. It, it, it just was a bit of a kick in the guts to see how early he did it. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, what, what do you think will happen now? Will Ron Paul uh, potentially... Uh, run as a third party? I mean, I know there's been some talk of that. That might just be the rumor mill, for all I know. I don't, I don't think so. Um, it, it, because he does support his son working within the Republican Party, mm -hmm. and he doesn't want to do anything to compromise that. And he might win. <laughs> but, you know, Gary Johnson is running as the Libertarian Party nominee. He's also not a philosophical Libertarian, but he's certainly closer uh, to, to that you know, on a lot of issues and better than, than Rand Paul, but it really becomes kind of a toss-up at that point. Uh, and it's kind of sad that the, the Libertarian Party didn't nominate a real philosophical Libertarian this time because when it's Romney Care versus Obamacare, you know, being the, being the primary third candidate is going to be a really incredible opportunity that Gary Johnson is enjoying right now. But I don't think Ron was ever in it to win it in the first place. Mm. And that's so he's what, more of an issue guy. He wants to get certain issues out there. Yeah. Well, what's crazy is to think that he wanted probably to come as close to winning as possible. And he was, not, he was but, leading in the polls at one point. He was actually well, leading in national right, polls. And, and when the recounts have been done, has actually won several states and could have had a lot more momentum if he had pushed the legal issues with all the vote fraud that was going on earlier in the campaign. But what he has done by coming into the RNC with about 500 delegates, you know, he would need 1144 for the nomination. I mean, that's like sliding into home plate and missing it by a quarter of an inch. You know, it's that precise of a job of saying, like, I want to come this close, but I don't want to win. Right. Because if you understood what Ron Paul understood about the nature of government and the Federal Reserve, you probably wouldn't want to be president either. I wouldn't want to be holding the bag <laughs> when it hits I get a sense Obama doesn't like being president sometimes. I don't know. It's just weird. I, I, I don't know. You do get that vibe. Sometimes he just looks so depressed. I just feel like he <laughs> wants to lose. Just, I, yes. get me out of this place. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. But I think... That's more from not the, the, the toil of being president. I think he thoroughly enjoys exercising his power. I think he's just frustrated that he isn't still as popular as he was when he was campaigning. It also seems like there is a, a lot more of a, a limited degree of power than maybe one might realize. I mean, obviously, every presidential candidate makes an insane amount of promises, but you need a Congress to back you up in the end. If, you, if, if they don't have your back, you know, you're basically a lame duck. You're sitting around. <laughs> Right, and his failure in being able to have the Democratic Party hold on to the House in 2010 was probably the, the turning point for him. But yeah, in, in terms of making his presidency less enjoyable, the limitations of power that he realized when he got there, I'm sure put a damper on things. I'm going to need to wrap things up. I want to ask you just quickly, though, before I go, do you plan on uh, running uh, for office again yourself? Any, any future plans? You know, I've... I've I've said that I'll only run for office again if someone can find a constituency where 51% of the voters sign sworn affidavits before the campaign even starts <laughs> that they'll vote for me. Because I, I don't really feel like putting myself through that again. But I'm considering running for president in 2020, starting this November on the platform of dissolving the federal government entirely. And I think if only by 2019, when we're ramping up the Republican debates, I might have enough support in the Republican Party to actually force the conversation around this idea. But if you love America, you have to see that we'd be better off with 50 independent states capable of responding to the needs of their citizens rather than having this centralized authority that is clearly not accountable to the public. Adam Kokish, uh, uh, of course, host of Adam vs. The Man. Thank you so much for coming, Adam. Uh, this has been Sky vs. Sky. Uh, check us out on the web. And I'm Matt Sky. Have a good night.